questions that we probably know the answers to. Okay, let's do the book club thing. Yay, book and club. And maybe, maybe nobody will show up somehow. It was just me okay. and Ben last week. I know, but that's because I was, like, you know, busy. How dare I was aware. You? I was like, I was like, no, it's book club time, but we're out. It's okay. <laughs> but I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to be there because we had, like, ten people in town, so. You know. Anyways. Anyway. Last time on book club that was like six weeks ago or something. Forever. Or eight weeks ago. <laughs> uh, no, it couldn't have been that long. But last time we established that sometimes there's dirty laundry in the good stuff. There is yeah. also hypocrisy and not so savory things happening. So this Part four is about awakening in the laundry. So how we can find meaning even in the bad things that people are doing, or even when the leaders are not so... What would you call that? Uh, when they don't always practice what they preach, I guess? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a lot of like anecdotes in here. Some of them I think are, were a little bit better than others. Beyond the anecdote, at least on this page, I did like where it was discussing how if we're trying to open our hearts, we can't leave anything out. Mm -hmm. And I did appreciate that sentiment and this idea of not trying to shove certain things under the radar as you really learn to let go yes because i think that that i have definitely been guilty of that of this idea of like all right i'm gonna i'm gonna free myself of all these things and really just work on myself in all these areas but not that area that area is <laughs> gross so i'm gonna hide it <laughs> or i think there was a little bit of the that nuance of like um sometimes people think that they are working or that they have um, quieted some part of themselves because it's in the past, but actually mm -hmm. they're just not looking at it and they're just stuffing it down instead of like sitting with it. And there's a, it's sometimes easy to ignore that just because you're not thinking about that thing doesn't mean you're over it. Yeah. Which is 100%. a good point. Mm -hmm. I didn't highlight or record anything about, like, I don't remember if he actually had a quote specifically about that, but just in general, kind of like the sentiment of part of this chapter. Yeah. Oh, also this, uh, which part is it in, in here? That there are s different strengths and that different people... Uh, if we're focusing in one area, it's still possible that we're neglecting another area, right? That, mm -hmm. As you said, that giving the example that somebody who's uh, devoted to like their spiritual life may have a bad personal life, or somebody who's very skilled with something physically could be really, really, really emotionally struggling, uh, and that even the masters of any particular craft usually means they're not really mastering the other areas because they focus so much on one and that those areas could still bring us uh, suffering mm -hmm. uh, did he say that actually good quote from from gandhi here that one Cannot do right in one department of life while still occupied in doing wrong in any other department. Life is an indivisible whole. Although, I thought that that quote was a little bit different than what was being said in the preceding paragraph. But I think it's still true, like... I mean, this feels more like it's focused on if you're actively trying to do wrong in the sense of, like, pursuing greed or... Uh, I don't know, pursuing, like actively pursuing something that is considered to be unwholesome. 
Mm -hmm. Like you're doing, you're doing wrong here. Then it doesn't really matter how well you're doing in this other area because it's like corrupt, right? Yeah. Versus, I thought that preceding this quote, it was more on the the idea of like that you're just kind of overlooking your needs. Like you just haven't focused on it. Not that you were like actively pursuing something bad. You just kind of like let it slide <laughs> or slip by the wayside over there. But still, still good. Still good. Um, then let's see. What page is this? Oh. Hello! Max has joined us. Good. Okay, I'm looking for where the quote is because I was writing, I was reading this on the plane, so I like screenshotted things thinking I would highlight it, but then I fell asleep. So now I just have the screenshot of the area it is and I have to find the, the sentence I wanted. <laughs> oh, actually, um, this, at the top of this page here, I like this point that we may believe that the body or relationships or future planning or money or sexuality or family or community or politics is unspiritual, dangerous, ugly, a trap. This fear puts up walls, isolates our heart from living, divides the world so that part of it is seen as not holy. Our experiences of realization remain compartmentalized and unfulfilled like bonsai trees, beautiful but stunted. Mm. And that's like, this is definitely something I've seen in basically every religion yeah i think a lot of people who even aren't religious kind of think about things this way and the, just this main point of this chapter right was recognizing that daily life and like the the mundane or like these things that are common across like no matter who you are you have all of these things to concern you at some point in life and that it's okay to have those things present in life. Mm -hmm. And there's a good, like, there can be a good way for dealing with them, but suppressing them or demonizing them is not the proper way. <laughs> you shouldn't lean into them too much, and you also should not condemn them, but rather find the middle path for all of these things, ideally. Also here. Uh... I'll be right I'm... back. I'm gonna go get on my computer. Okay. Got it. I think that ties in really well with the next page. It's like um, page 167. Uh, he ties it all together fairly well in this section where he says um, non-attachment and discriminating wisdom are reconciled as a whole. And so that same idea of not demonizing mm -hmm. these things but instead finding the reconciling wisdom of how to approach them. So discriminating wisdom can set boundaries, say yes and no, stand up for justice and act for compassion. It becomes an unselfish and fearless expression of wise non-attachment. Mm -hmm. And I think we come back to that point at least a few times in other texts as well, where you're not trying to abandon everything that has to do with just being a person existing in the world. But finding ways to wisely pursue non-attachment with them. Right. That there is, a, I guess it's the recognition that there is a place in the world and in life, and in particular in spiritual life, for all of these aspects of human life. And in fact, if you're not making a place for those things, then you're probably missing the point and doing it wrong. Mm-hmm. The laundry. <laughs> the laundry. I think this book, at least these cha two chapters, did a pretty good little job of jumping into different things and kind of untangling some thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I feel like really we finally nice. got to the point, right? Mm -hmm. Like, all of the prep we got in the first three parts of this book are now yeah. like, okay, this is what the book's actually about. 
Mm-hmm. We've seen the problems that people have. We've seen the benefits that they have to awakening. But then how do you actually blend it together in a way that is sustainable and productive and honest? Right. Here, actually, over here, too, we're just talking about the poison tree and that if we, if we, rather than trying to destroy everything or suppress it, that we just understand and become aware of the dangers, but that maybe it also has something that is potentially useful to offer us as well. Like they said, uh, maybe you can make medicine out of this thing that is poisonous, you know. Maybe the way to cure yourself could be in the things that are hurting you, but rather well, than... Well, and as he posted it earlier, we passed it, it can be compost for the garden. Or, yeah. Everything that's that we think is bad isn't always evil. It's has its place as well. Yeah. Enrich our garden as compost, as nourishment for life itself. oh yeah this too same same paragraph if we don't choose to look that which is unattended will come find us the lost parts of ourselves will present themselves knocking ever louder if we don't listen to their cries mm-hmm. we end up hearing their voices in divorce or depression in illness or some strange failure if we do listen and welcome all parts of the self we will find they enrich our garden as compost as nourishment for life itself and that sentiment, I think, has been... I guess that's just the wisdom that, like, everybody comes to this conclusion if they've gone through it, right? They eventually figure out that, oh, it's just, it's happened, and you learn how to use it, or you let it destroy the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Medicine for awakening. I really appreciated the next section, the middle path. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought there was a lot of little good bits, although the very long biscuit story was interesting, but weird. <laughs> the biscuit story? <laughs> yeah, he tells a long story about biscuits in, this, in the next section. Okay, wait. I'm not remembering. This is one more which... page. There it is. Oh, <laughs> yeah. The biscuit. I'm sorry. I've been in Europe too long. I keep. I thought you made cookies, and I was like, "What?" No, no. I don't remember a story the, about cookies. <laughs> no, no. The uh, the the worst yeah, kind yeah. of biscuits. 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 Yeah. Um. So if we go back before that, though, there's uh-huh. actually good stuff on that page. <laughs> <laughs> I just was like, ah, the biscuit story. <laughs> that stuck with me because I. A very food oriented human being mm. and need to be less so, but here we are. <laughs> I have to become reoriented with biscuits. <laughs> um, near the top of that page on the right side, I re- I highlighted it. the middle path embraces opposites. Mm. It rests between them, acknowledging both truths caught by neither side. In this way, we can see from one perspective that human life is suffering and it's inevitable string of losses culminating in sickness aging and death max as you did not read this section i'll tell you that before that it was cool because it was a teacher explaining why some of his teachings sounded like contradictions and it was mostly when someone is going too far to the left i tell them to go to the right and when someone's going too far to the right i tell them go to the left Mm -hmm. and so that's i thought that was a really good little Reminder that sometimes where you're at can make something sound odd, I guess. The perspective changes meaning sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the advice is going to be different depending on where you are. Especially in that case, oh, go left. You can't go wrong to go left when you're on the right edge, right? But mm-hmm. if they told you, well, you need to be in the middle, but they're like, where's the middle? They don't know they're on the edge, right? 
Yeah. This. Also, the lightheartedness of the it, like just laughing and being like, like, oh yeah, I know it's because I I live here. <laughs> I've been in this place before, but you haven't. Ah. Just always, it's like I said this to the teacher, and they laughed. It's like good. That's probably a good teacher. <laughs> That's a good teacher. Also, this bit, this is like not really. I didn't feel similar to the rest of the chapter, but still a good point. When he's talking about the wounded healers, and that mm. they found that the psychologists who worked in a detached way were not as effective at helping others understand themselves and heal than the ones who shared their own difficulties and pains that, like, and struggles that they've had. Mm -hmm. That the connection that they made with their patients did a lot more to helping them heal and well I guess maybe in healing themselves but they had the greatest healing in their patients if they also were revealing their own healing journey mm -hmm. I think this is true in a lot of aspects of our interactions with people um, as a school teacher I find myself being a better teacher when I allow my empathy to to exist because being detached from the students while I can be a little more unbiased when executing disciplinary action I find that I don't meet the students needs as well um, and I don't so like yes have I ended the action that and taking care of the situation, yes. But I find that long term, I don't see as good of results. So that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And maybe they trust you more and then they listen, like take to heart what you say more. If you're in the or teaching, feel like... in teacher land, we have a we have a kitschy little saying that is both true, but also gets grates on your nerves with how often you hear it, which is that kids don't care what you let's see what you're trying to kids don't care <laughs> what you're trying to get them to learn until they learn how much you care mm. it's something like that and it's effectively a very true thing about students in that many of our students especially when they come from less than ideal circumstances just don't care about education unless they feel like you care about them as a person. But that's a, that's maybe a slightly different tangent. My apologies. I think a lot of your tangents are still relevant to what we're talking about in, in book club in general. Like, I don't know. Or maybe that's just me feeling like our conversation, like the conversations and the reading that we're doing isn't just about the reading that we're doing like all of these things are about life too and if we can't if we don't use the text to understand what's happening in life then what's the point of the text I guess mm -hmm. why are we reading it then <laughs> mm -hmm. to me what's happening in Des's life that is applicable it's still important too yay yay um <clears throat> connected to this train of thought near the bottom of the that right side page i highlighted another thing the wise heart is at peace with the way things are no longer struggling against the world or lost in it we rest and wow. i've been thinking about uh compassion fatigue recently Ooh. and yes that finding the middle ground when it comes to not closing off myself from the realities of the struggles of my students and stuff because we have so many kiddos who are just coming from not great times and they're not they're not always to the extreme level of like gotta get cps involved but they're still not good you know what i mean yeah and so you just if you let yourself you can become overwhelmed with it and so this sentence resonates with me as far as like letting my heart be wise about it not that i'm happy with the way things are 
but resting in the knowledge that I'm doing what I can to make those kids' lives better. Yeah. And letting that be enough until a circumstance comes up that I need to take advantage of. You know what I mean? Until there's yeah. something actionable I can do, don't struggle with the emotions of not feeling like I'm doing enough, I guess. Yeah, there's always going to be suffering in the world that we can't prevent or it's not, like, we're not in the position... Yeah. We're not the person that needs to make the change, right? Like, maybe in that case, it's their parent that needs to do something, like, be better for them, or... Like, I still want to be a good teacher to them, and providing them with, uh... With good stuff, I just... Can't get overwhelmed with all the other parts of it. <laughs> um... <laughs> It reminds me of some of the sentiments that, uh, you weren't in book club when we read Beyond Anger, were you? Uh, I don't know. Um, it's called Beyond Anger, How to Hold on Your Heart and Your Humanity in the Midst of Injustice by, uh... I don't think I did. By someone whose name I can't pronounce. <laughs> and don't think I read that one no if I recall correctly she was in oh Vietnam during all of the bad stuff that the US was doing anyway I learned a lot <laughs> during that book about just doing what you can. <laughs> yeah, like, it doesn't actually help anybody to be, to feel miserable all the time about the misfortune that's happening to somebody else. Yes, yes. And if you live like that, then it just makes the world worse, really. Yeah, exactly and that. Thank you. you're less available for the things that you can make a difference in, right? Like, if we're just stressed and miserable... And I think this is very much like the, um, like activist fatigue, right? Like mm -hmm. you're, you're concerned, like you're really fired up and passionate about all these issues and you want to make a difference and you, it's so wrong. There's so much injustice in the world and you can be caught up in that and just live your whole life, every waking moment, angry and like trying to make people aware and trying to do something better but in reality like the majority of what you do has very little effect on any of those actual problems you don't connect with the people who are suffering mm -hmm. and like you yeah it's good to be compassionate but your compassion in translated into the actions that you're doing do very little if anything at all and all it's doing is making other people like your own life and other people's lives right that are closer to you, worse, because now you're not able to do anything that's going to make that actual difference in your in your actual life. Like, you can worry about the billions of other lives that are going through something bad, but you'll never touch them. Mm -hmm. And in the more people... I think it's also, like, the more people that you're concerned about. Like, the more you try to do as one single person without the resources to actually change infrastructure or institutions mm -hmm. it's just more useless like we make the most difference on a one-to-one -one basis unless we are unless we end up getting access to like power or money or something where right we can make real change. a windfall of circumstance and you're yeah. like suddenly i can change all the things <laughs> or i mean or if you happen to have been born into like a wealthy family that you know you have money to start charities and like go mm -hmm. make things happen with the money then okay maybe like okay you're an heiress of disney and you're putting your money into f making things better in certain parts of the world okay that's actually making a tangible difference yeah but otherwise i mean i guess even in that case if you spent all day every day just 
being like emotionally drained by the suffering of the world, you're still probably not going to make as much of a difference as you would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. So sort of maybe counterintuitive to the way that a lot of people think being younger, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Patient caring are our gifts. Understanding humility and patient caring. Yeah. Not to force a jump too far ahead, but at the top of chapter 12, I really liked the opening sentence. Before enlightenment, we have to live in our body. After enlightenment, we still have to live with our body. Yes. Yes. This chapter, I felt like, oh, yeah, I I need to do this. <laughs> I need to do better. <laughs> I mean, some of it's like I, I really felt that, like, hyper focus into one area but then at the sacrifice of another area right and especially for my body like i burnt myself out way too much like a decade ago i'm still dealing with it i mean part of it's also health issues and that i don't think the health issues were Girl. caused by that <laughs> but they're there anyway and making it harder yes. but if i hadn't burnt myself out so much then maybe those things wouldn't have been as bad or like maybe uh, by now i would have been I have similar reflections, so my deepest empathy. I'm like, <laughs> oh, if only I had been kinder to my body. <laughs> then... and, I, and I felt like I was, you know, I thought I did pretty good in the sense of, like, I've been pretty conscious of my eating and, like, stretching and, you know, like, <laughs> doing more active stuff. And... I think it's the less visible parts. Right? Because you have to be aware also of, like, your adrenal system and uh -huh. um, the stress neurons in your brain. <laughs> like, it's not just the physical, but all of it that comes together in the hardware of our little brain place and all the other little doodads of the system that I think <laughs> that personally for me, as I, I'm like, oh, empathy on this is that I really wish I hadn't pushed my adrenal system and stressors the way that I did, you know? Or like I... every time that you go, I'm just going to do one more thing. I'm just going to do this one more thing. Right, instead of taking <laughs> care of myself and saying, you know what, I deserve, I, I, can, I can have some downtime. <laughs> Maybe it's good if I go to sleep and not just keep working. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but just compounded over many years of... And the way that, like, I mean, another thing, too, he, this is talking here in this chapter about a lot of the religious side of it, of, oh, religions that are getting it wrong and how it's affected people that they're neglecting one area or another. But I think that's also, even just in, like, a layman's cultural sense, too, like, in America especially, we, which I'm, I'm more... Uh, attuned to it now that I've spent more time with Europeans and very different work culture but we have such a such a, a sense of urgency like the thing we have to do for work is it needs to happen now it's the most important thing in the world and everybody just like rallies around these task lists and metrics and like all the stuff that we were supposed to care about this and we need to do this and it, it's like people get so stressed all the time and there's it the list never ends like you've never there's never a point where you don't have anything that could that needs to be done if you're doing well right like the better you're doing the more things you have to do and nothing's ever enough there's always going to be more no matter how good a job you did on that there's still more stuff to do and there's never enough time to do it and the and then people get off of work and they're still thinking about work, but then they don't have time to do all the other things. And it just gets wilder and more hectic, chaotic, the more children, like the older people get until they retire. And then I guess they have time suddenly magically. Wow. But we live in a culture, like a society and the culture of the society is one that 
it's just like you should care about these things but then you know you ever feel like that and then quit a job and then realize how little any of that stuff actually mattered at all <laughs> it is one of the single most largest reasons i as a teacher do not bring any work home Unless it's literally, hey, that looks neat, and then I save the bookmark to look at for later <laughs> from the internet. Uh-huh. Um, I personally, that I don't helps. bring home lesson planning. I don't bring home projects to get ready unless I am jazzed. Like, it energizes me kind of project, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're really passionate about I'm it. I'm passionate. I'm like, oh, it. I love doing this. This is going to be so cool. But I don't do anything that's like, oh, this got to get done. No. <laughs> that can wait till I'm being paid. <laughs> yeah none of it matters it just i feel like it's like that so they're t saying to oh we need to focus all our energy on this thing and neglecting i mean it's very short-sighted and short-term like we're neglecting our bodies we're neglecting our minds we're not managing our stress we're not managing our like physical well-being because we're putting everything into one area and when you're surrounded by other people who are living like that too, it's encouraging us to act that way as well. And like, it's sort of, uh, I don't know if it, you can really say mob mentality, but kind of seems like that. Like you're around people who are concerned about these things and then you are more likely to feel that stress and energy and be concerned with those things. And if you're around people who see it a little bit better it'll be easier to be like them too we also had in this chapter a lot of the um like for women the shame of the female body specifically a sort of like inherent sinfulness and how that was like like the nun saying that reinforced deeply reinforced her own inner shame. It's very That's a, that's a mood coming up in a Christian society uh -huh. for me. Yeah. And the caution so story of Senjo, caution not cutting off part of yourself, living true to yourself. Mm. All this about also, like, noticing your body and how like, this story about um, Joan Tollefson, Zen teacher with one arm. Now, she never really looked at herself in her, in her arm until she was 25, was it? And then to, to see what is... And to not have, like, those feelings about it that we, like, she said the horror was not in her body, but in your head. And if we just, like, really, the cost of not looking is greater, he says. <laughs> it may be painful to look closely, but the cost of not looking is greater. Not looking brings a loss of feeling and connection with ourselves and this earth, with our very human life. It engenders a loss of our innate and instinctive wisdom. Just a lot of stories about that. Yeah, I really loved that. Oh, this bit too. Um... The, po the problem, unstated until now, is how to live in a damaged body in a world where pain is meant to be gagged, uncured, ungrieved over. The problem is to connect, without hysteria, the pain of one's body with the pain of the world's body. Speed and pervasive disconnection of modern consumer society. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel that one. It's like the mm -hmm. body being reduced to, like, productivity alone. Yeah. So where the normal 
human experience becomes like an exception and you're not supposed to just drown it in coffee <laughs> i do <laughs> <laughs> don't worry absolutely drowned in coffee <laughs> <laughs> No. Um, you're right, though. I, And I reflect on that occasionally of, like, how much is my desire to push harder coming from the actual need to do so versus some magical thinking idea that if I just push harder, I'll be worth more. And so as I, like, connect all these different little dots going on in my head from this chapter. Mm-hmm. I think he did a pretty good job showing how, or like, reminding us to question the beliefs that we have about all of these things and how those might be holding us back or causing us damage or in the long term, like, guiding us down the wrong paths. Like, he has so many little anecdotes mm -hmm. and quotes from people who said, oh, I lived my life this way, I was so devoted, and then I had this horrible accident, or I had Oof, yeah. a great illness, and then I realized that I'd been doing things wrong, mm -hmm. and I changed my ways, or I abandoned everything that I had done. And the thing they had done was, like, a devout spiritual life. And some of them, I went back to it, but in a different way, and other ones just completely abandoned it entirely. Mm-hmm. That if we can find a way to live, like, more moderately in the first place, and without losing sight of those things, then maybe th these accidents wouldn't happen, or maybe we would live uh, less regretfully, I guess? Mm -hmm. I don't know that they're all regretful, but they definitely thought that they were doing it incorrectly and changed. So... here um, if we are to become whole we must reclaim the body holding even its pain and limitation as our own yes oh yes and then embodied enlightenment talking about embodied enlightenment so being aware of this because we so often neglect the body that we need to actually pay more attention to the body and not pretend we don't have one but I love pretending I don't have a body. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Just, uh, Max, just. Uh, Max, uh, not offering anything, just a slight a giggle. A laugh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the contribution today, is the giggle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one. I actually really liked um, this beginning of this poem. The bud stands for all things, even for those things that don't flower, for everything flowers from within of self-blessing, though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on the brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch. It is lovely until it flowers again from within. I like it. Sometimes we forget. Oh yeah, there this was a one quote is an embodied awakening neither denies nor reviles the body nor does it grasp and mindlessly indulge in pleasures. In embodied awakening, we become present for the life that is given us, respectful of what the Tibetans call this precious human form. Yeah. Yeah. Easier said than done. As usual. Uh, 
And then talked about a, a lot about sexuality and people going to one extreme or the other because they haven't figured out how to like navigate it well. Yeah, just mindfulness, I guess, is what the rest of it kind of comes down to. It's just being aware of your body, living in your body, not neglecting your body. <laughs> Be nice to your body. Recognizing that you only have one body. You need your body to do the laundry. Two. Too bad. Too bad. You get one. I'll Don't never be greedy. <laughs> I need a spare. In case this one blows a flat. Well, yeah, they only. don't work like that. We have the reminder too. Every spiritual master faces the difficulties of fatigue, sickness, and death just as we do. What dedicated practice gives us are the tools to awaken compassion and awareness in this human realm. Ways for the heart to hold it all. It's just how to tolerate more. And then mm -hmm. use that to have the loving kindness of Tonglen. Tonglen! That's right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then do our work with, oh, with our whole body in it. Is this going to work? I don't know, but I got to go pretty soon. Whoa. Yeah, it's time. This is pretty much the end of the chapter, yeah? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Mm. It was a good chapter, though. Yeah. It's kind of like. The reminders of everything, but with the, like, very pointed examples about why. <laughs> uh, it ends on a very cute little sentence. Freedom of the heart is found not by looking up. It is right here, woven in colors beneath our feet. Yeah, it's cute. Although that story was kind of like, wait, um... <laughs> <laughs> Look, the guy who was this upset. This is the man who gave us a whole story about biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, like, in one Middle Eastern story, a man falsely identified as a criminal was put in prison. His friend visited and left him a prayer rug. The prison went. The prisoner went angrily back to his cell. He had hoped for a hacksaw or a knife, and all he'd gotten was this rug. But since he had it, he figured he might as well use it. So he started bowing on the rug to pray. Each day he became more familiar with the pattern woven onto the rug, and he started to see an interesting image there. It was a diagram of the lock that allowed him to open the cell and escape. Like, I thought this was going a different way. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah. But yeah, I guess the sentence after that is cute. <laughs> I can I can choose to ignore whatever I want about Ria. <laughs> <laughs> wait. Wait. But yeah, good chapter. We're getting into the, you know, real substance of the title and such so good job go team yay we did it, we did it. it's we noon did it.